Russell Steelworks. We make steel here. In the Newcastle Steelworks, we make steel for all Australia. We make good steel. We make steel at low cost. We make steel fast. At Newcastle Steelworks, steel making is our job. And it's been our job for 50 years. In the early 1900s, the men of the Broken Hill Proprietary faced declining returns from their mines. To go on, they needed a new industry. The company owned huge reserves of iron ore used in lead smelting, so General Manager Del Pratt recommended using the ore to establish a new industry, steelmaking. Backed by Chairman John Darling, Del Pratt searched the world for an advisor. In the United States, he found David Baker, an expert on the establishment of steelworks, and invited him to Australia. In 1912, Baker arrived. The high quality of the Australian ore astonished him. He found that there was plenty of suitable coal, that other raw materials were available. He recommended the establishment of a steelworks. But where to build it? The swamps along the Hunter River did not look promising but there were developed coal mines nearby. The water of the river would serve the steelworks. And there was a port, a good port. The land was swampy, but the New South Wales government agreed to dredge a channel for shipping and to pump the spoil to the site, raising the level of the land. In 1913, construction began. David Baker travelled by tram every day to the site, and people said, the steelworks will never do any good. The manager has to go there on the penny tram. In spite of what people said, the work went on. The company had promised it would be completed in five years. The builders did it in less than three. In 1915, they finished. On the 2nd, 1915, the works were opened by Governor-General Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson. At the opening, everyone enjoyed a good dinner. They enjoyed it because it was a good dinner, and because now there was, operating, the first plant in Australia for the large-scale production of steel. It was 50 years ago, 1915, and Newcastle was producing steel. Guests at the opening took away pieces of the first rail produced. Most of these pieces are still about today, and so are many of the men who were working at the steelworks in those days, like Jack Jordan, who started with the steelworks before construction was completed. I started work here in July 1914 on the telephone exchange afternoon shift. After five o'clock, of course, there were few, if any, calls. And my job, if I may call it so, was to go up to the pumps, collect the fish for the two watchmen that worked on the works at that time, and hand over the fish to them. But I don't recall ever getting any for myself. I knew Mr. Baker, our first manager. Uh, insofar as I call myself one of his staff, Part of my duties was occasionally to go up to his home, pick up his cut lunch. Naturally, I would think a lot of Mrs. Baker, uh, because being a boy, I got a piece of cake or a piece of fruit or something off Mrs. Baker every time I went up. Just have to collect the lunch. I remember very well the blowing in of the number one blast furnace. In those days, none of the employees uh, had seen a blast furnace tap and the smoke and fires coming out and we all start to run as fast as we could and as far away from the furnace as possible. But on the opposite direction was a, one of the blowers came along, an American, he said, don't run away, it won't hurt you, but it didn't stop us running. It was 1915 and we were in production. 
But before we did get into production, something else had happened. World War One. We'd started out to make rails to produce the 150,000 tons a year Australia had been importing. We kept on making rails, we had to. No one else in the world could supply. So when the first train crossed Australia, it ran on rails we'd made in Newcastle. We sent rails to South Africa too. European rails were needed for the war in France. Steel for making shells went to England. The manufacturers used it too, said it was good. Australia shipbuilders couldn't import steel plate, so we rolled it for them on an improvised bloom mill. Most of our steel went into rails, and we reckoned we could keep on doing that, supplying Australia. We had our troubles, growing pains you could call them, but we thought we were getting over them pretty well. When Australia wanted steel, we were ready to supply it. Things looked pretty good at the end of the war. When the Prince of Wales visited the plant in 1920, we turned on quite a show for him. To take him around the plant, we laid on a special train. He did a complete tour, and everyone had a chance to see him. We thought things looked pretty good. We were in for a shock. Suddenly, all over the world, there was plenty of steel, too much steel. There was supply, oversupply, and practically no demand. Surplus steel from overseas was dumped in Australia. There was no way for us to compete with steel sold under cost, and our own costs were rising coal prices, wages. The only choice the company had was to keep going at a loss or to close down, for a while at least. In 1922, the decision was made. The works closed. And some of the men who remember the close down are still working here. Jim Ryan is one of them. Started as a cake oven in 1918 uh, as a boy. And uh, from later, a couple of years later, I went into a men's job. I worked until 1922, uh, had a break for six months, the place, the work closed down. I came back and I have been there ever since. Uh, the changes, the most, one of the biggest changes I think has been safety. In the early days, we did not not have the equipment we have today, such as helmets, uh, goggles, face shields, gloves, boots. Yeah, so I think the uh, big change was safety. During the break, some men were kept on, doing maintenance, working on improvements that would mean lowered costs when we started up again. But we weren't making steel. There was no point in that. The world had more steel than it needed. It was a tough time. Times did get better. In March of 23, after nine months, the works opened again. It was pretty good to be back on the job, and we were happy to be there. We were back in production, but things weren't easy. Making steel is always hard work. Now, selling it was hard work, too. We did our best to meet overseas competition. We had to. We had to lower our costs. That meant a drive for more efficiency. We built some new plants and modernized what we had. Steel output increased. We were competing. Then the depression hit us. Demand for steel fell again. We couldn't help remembering the close down, but we kept on with the drive for efficiency. 
And this time we managed to keep production going. A lot of us went on short time, but the steelwork stayed open. When people started to buy steel again, we had it for them. And one of the people who can remember those times is Mrs. Fred Rogers. Well, I'm married to a steel worker. My husband started working at the steel works in 1917, a week after his 14th birthday. He served his apprenticeship to fitting and turning, and we were married in 1928. In 1930, the Depression hit us, and we lost our home, so we went out to Kilburn Bay to live in a home that a friend of ours lent us. Out there we lived on the dole and tomatoes and fish. And while we were out there, everybody grew tomatoes, gave us tomatoes. I got hardly sick of them. But never mind, it helped the budget. And um, we were out there for about 18 months and one day Mr Rogers' father came out to tell us that he could start work on the Monday. I did a little weep, and I must confess I did. Not because I was altogether happy, but because I was a little bit sad at losing old friend, uh, friends. But never mind, we started work and uh, we went in for another home, the one we're in at the moment. He's worked there ever since, and uh, we have two children, a daughter and a son. The son-in-law served his time at the uh, BHP, and their son works there as a carpenter. We've done very well, I think, and then about two years, I hope Mr Rogers will be retiring, and we intend to spend the rest of our days bowling and caravanning. By 1933, we were on the way again, working full-time, making good steel and at low cost. And this meant something outside the steelworks, too. After all, Newcastle itself was growing into a steel city. We were making steel again, but again we weren't allowed to develop the way we expected to. The Second World War made its own demand. made many new steel. We couldn't get the ferro alloys we needed to make steel from overseas, so we made them ourselves. And with the help of British experts, we produced magnesium. On our own, we set up the production of tungsten for tool steel. We did what we could, and perhaps a bit more, in spite of war. The war came closer. In fact, it turned up in our own backyard the night an enemy submarine shelled Newcastle. And the man who remembers that is Fred Rayfield. One night during the war, which I will never forget, was the night that the Japanese submarine shelled Newcastle. I'd come home off afternoon shift and retired about somewhere about 1 a.m. I heard these whizzing noises through the air. I got up to investigate and I saw the greatest sight in my, ever in my life, just in time to see the dreary light illuminate Newcastle. In the morning, the son and the wife, they both roused on me. I said, now listen, one frightened person per night was enough here. By 1945, we finished with war as far as fighting goes, but like the rest of the world, we found that you don't finish with a war overnight. Whatever you wanted, you got the same answer, short supply. Materials, transport, skilled men, all the world wanted these. So many countries were rebuilding. Whatever you wanted, you couldn't buy it. We kept on improving what we could. We worked for more efficiency. Production started to go up. We increased the capacity of our open hearths and blast furnaces. Migration brought us more men. They came from pretty well every country in Europe. England, Wales, Germany, Italy, you name the country and we'd find a man from there. When they first came, they didn't know what to expect and we didn't either. John Hermans from Holland can tell us about that. I, uh, I come from Holland, in, uh, from a little place called Noordwijk on the coast of the North Sea. I came to Australia with my family and uh, had two daughters at the time. And uh, well, the time passed by and the family grew to four daughters and three sons. 
The two elders are working now and four are going to school and the baby is still at home. We started off in a migrant camp and after about two and a half years I brought my own home. The reason I came to Australia was hoping to find stability and uh, security and that is what I found here in Newcastle with uh, the nice beaches and a very beautiful scenery and I'm very happy and quite satisfied with my work and the money is good as well. The uh, impression of Australia when I came here that was when I started working. I used to call the boss Sir and that is how I used to call him back home and uh, well, that time, uh, that went on for about three weeks, and my boss said, uh, or, uh, one of my mates said to me, he said, uh, oh, you don't call the boss, sir. He said, just call him Jack. I said, uh, oh, I said, it's a bit funny. He said, I said, oh, he said, uh, we, uh, that is uh, how they always used to do it here. I said, oh, I said, so after, in the beginning, it was a bit strange, but I got used to it after. By the early 50s, we were starting to build again, and we needed space. So the first thing to do was to go right back to the days of 1915. We started reclaiming land again, from the Hunter River at Platts Channel. Programs and specifications, plans and schedules. It was the beginning of the greatest development since the steelworks was built. It looked like the old start over again but it was in a very different direction. Newcastle once again is taking the lead in the development of new methods of production, testing new steel techniques under Australian conditions. Progress at Newcastle makes a list of new developments. The new scalp mill, the new sinter plant treats iron ore for maximum efficiency, and the latest automatic controls regulate the process. <laughs> The Central Control Laboratory can give the men at the furnaces a report on test samples in a matter of minutes. The number four blast furnace is built to the latest design, and again there are automatic controls for the feeding of ore, coal, coke, limestone to the furnace. rod mill turns billets four at a time to steel rod that is the raw material for wire making. to produce steel by the most modern method in the world, basic oxygen steel making. Materials are fed to the furnace in minutes. A lance is lowered into the furnace to blow oxygen into the charge. hours to make steel in the open half, we now do it in an hour. At Newcastle, we're still making steel. We're making it better. We're making it faster. The processes we're developing here will be the basis of steel production all over Australia. What 
we've done so far is only the beginning. There are plans for another merchant bar mill to produce steel bars to new standards of accuracy. Another basic oxygen furnace that will feed steel to a new process, continuous casting. The system of curved moulds we'll use in Newcastle is the world's most recent steel development. Handling of ingots will be eliminated, time saved, quality improved. The history of modern steelmaking covers only a hundred years, and half of that hundred years we've been working here in Newcastle. Another generation of steelmakers is growing up, and one of them is Bob Murray. I've been at the steelworks for ten years now. I come from a small country town, a place called Condoblin. I came here as a trainee. I served four years on the plant as a fitting and turning apprentice. This was part of my course. I also attended university part-time during this course. And I have graduated as a BE, Bachelor of Engineering Mechanical. Whilst on the plant, I've seen some exciting things. This has been an exciting period. Exciting from a work's point of view, and exciting from a personal point of view. Since coming here, I've been married. We're building our own home, and as a matter of fact, we're expecting what I hope will be another little steel worker. When I said it was exciting, I meant exciting. We've installed large new plants. Steel is changing. We're going to install more. My son is assured of a job here. Steel is a national commodity. Steel is a commodity. Today's world is built on steel. At Newcastle, we make steel. 50 years ago, we started here with 1,500 men. Today, there are more than 11,000. We've done more than build the steelworks. We've helped to build a city, the city of Newcastle. From today, we can look back 50 years. Some of us, like Jack Lewis, to the first days of production and before that. Well, uh, in the first place, I think I'd better tell you that I am a Welshman. But the distant horizon was always beckoning to me. I left my native land when I was 19 and went to America. Had about nearly five years in the steel industry there. Very fortunate period. In as much as I landed a job as roller when I was 22 and continued there and consequently getting that job so early I was in what they termed in those days the big money. The result was that after a year or two, my pockets began to bulge and I got restless again. And I applied for a three months leave of absence to go back home to Wales and spend Christmas with my parents at the end of 1913. Crossing the Atlantic, I happened to pick up a magazine called The Iron Age. And in it I read where there was a steelworks going up in Australia. And an American by the name of David Baker had been selected to get it started. And I thought to myself, well, I'd like to see Australia too. So when I got home to Wales, I wrote to Mr. David Baker, told him who I was, where I was, and acquainted him with the experience that I had had. About the Christmas time, or a little before Christmas, 1913, I got a cable from him telling me that he thought there would be plenty of opportunities for a young man of my description. So, 
I set sail for Australia in the January. Yes, my first trip to the steelworks was a long, long walk. A water policeman showed me where to get a ferry across to the dike end, which is now the state dockyard. After that, it was walk, 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 and it was a very long walk. Eventually, I came to an area, a lot of sand hillocks, partly swamp, and uh, I stumbled along amongst this sand a little while, and I eventually stumbled over a piece of machinery that I recognized. It was the crankshaft of the Blooming Mill engine, and I knew that I was there. Looking at the steelworks today, and visioning it as I saw it 50 years ago, 51 years ago, the accumulation of the changes have amounted to such an extent that it's very hard to uh, enumerate them, they've all come in their turn. But in my opinion, the greatest and most important change was the advent of Essington Lewis. How much that man knew about steel making at that time, I don't know. But he knew enough to know that an untidy, dirty plant could not possibly be efficient. And he started in to clean it up. And he never let up on that job. And that, in my opinion, is the origin of their present day efficiency. The first 50 years, 1965, 1915. We remember the 1920s, the visit of the Prince of Wales, the trouble with dumping. Then there were the 30s, fighting the depression, getting over it, back to work, and World War II. After the war, the rebuilding started us on the road to today's developments, and there are developments to come. We've been making steel, good steel, for 50 years, and we'll go on making steel. Thank you.